Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Important verse. We're going to see that here in just a moment. But I want to make this statement, and I think you've heard it before, or maybe somebody said it to you. Family is important, right? Amen. Family is important. And even as I say that, and as you consider the verse that was just read, the New American Standard says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. For some people in this audience, that is a tough verse to follow. Because maybe you're growing up, your family life wasn't exactly what you would like for it to have been. I know that in an audience of this size, there are some families that are more loving toward one another, more expressive of that love, maybe in the form of hugs that are given or just in words of affirmation that are spoken. I also know that in an audience this size, there are those that may, families that tend to have been more distant from one another. I've heard people say, my dad never said he loved me until I was a grown adult. And, and as I say that, there are even possibly some families or some individuals in this audience that come from what we might call what would be labeled dysfunctional families. And what I mean by that is there were unrealistic expectations placed upon you as a young person growing up. Love was conditional. If you wanted to be loved, then you had to meet certain things. You were ridiculed in that family. Maybe you were even disrespected or you disrespected or somebody in the family disrespected their parents. And in those families, sometimes there was even contempt. There was emotional tolerance. Shut up. Stop crying. We don't cry in this family. And so when you interpret the verse that we have before us this morning, whether we like it or not, we tend to look at verses like this through the lens of our lives. If we grew up in a very loving family, then it's easy to see in this verse the type of family that the church is to be. If we grew up in a dysfunctional family and we're looking at this verse through those lens, then we think, no, nah, I'm not so sure that the church needs to be that. If you're a person here this morning that grew up in a family in which even though there were disagreements time to time and healthy discipline was practiced, you still knew that you were loved. You may be part of a family where brother and sister reached out to one another on a regular basis and you knew that you cared about each other. You might have fought with one another on occasion, but don't let anybody else fight with that sibling because you're going to defend them. You're going to take up for them. That's the way it was in your family. And even while you may not see each other because you're miles apart and have been for years, if one of you picks up the phone and calls the other, it's like you haven't been apart. You talk about the old times and family get-togethers are always fun because you, you remember those childhood memories and you laugh about some of the things that you did as kids. On the other hand, if your family was dysfunctional, you might not care to hear from a brother or sister because for them to call you only adds to the trauma, maybe opens old wounds, emotional um, difficulties that you have to relive and, and it's hard for you to do that. So as Paul writes this short statement, I hope to try to bring it to the point where we see it from God's point of view. What is it that God means to us in these words when he says that we are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love because he's speaking to us folks as a church a family of God which is what we are we are a family of God and as a family of God there is a way that God wants us to respond to each other and to treat each other last week I looked at the church as the body of Christ and now Paul is using the concept of family of God. And so when you compare these two, they are similar, but they're different. Because when Paul refers to us as the body of Christ, you may remember last week in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, he says that so then we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And so because of that, there is a way we are, we are put together for a purpose. 
And we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 14 and going through verse 26, and how he compares the church to the physical body. And the point that he makes there is that we're all necessary. We can't look out amongst ourselves and say, well, we don't need you as a part of this church. We don't need you as a part of this body because what Paul says is that every single one of us are a necessary part of this body that is his church. Yes, we may have different responsibilities, but we're all needed. We all are important here. But today, he looks at us as a family. And that takes on a whole different set of meanings and concepts. Because when we became Christians, we became a part of the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, Paul said there, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You are a part of God's household. Do you ever remember growing up you'd go to visit someone? Maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was a distant relative or somebody, or just a friend of the family. And you would be told while you were there, you're just like part of the family. You're a part of this family while you're among us, and we're glad you're here, and we're going to treat you that way. I can remember growing up as a boy, Next door to us, there was a large farm, and, and there were two boys. One was my age, one was my brother's age, and, and their grandmother lived in a little house there. They called her Big Mama. She wasn't this tall, but I always thought that was an interesting name for their grandmother, and I've heard that term used since then. It's a term of endearment. But while, whenever we were there, she treated us just as if we were her own. You know, we, we ate at her table, we would play outside, and you know, we were treated just like we were part of that family. The church is to be a family, and Paul uses this analogy as the functioning church. Why? Because it adds a dimension to the body. When you think about a family, typically, what do we think about? We think about warmth, we think about tenderness, we think about concern, we think about loyalty. There are thir- certain aspects of the family that just stand out in our minds when we go back and we reflect, and it helps to see the church from this perspective. Because what Paul wants us to think about when it comes to the church, to us here today, is the idea of, of emotion and devotion. We are emotionally connected to one another. We are to be devoted to one another from the aspect of a family. And so he he talks about how we are to relate to each other. And I just want to break this first part of this verse down into two things. He says, first of all, that we are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That word, brotherly love, comes from a Greek word that you've heard all your life. You just don't know it, maybe. You ever heard the word Philadelphia? Oh, yeah, that's up in the state of, you know, Pennsylvania. I know Philadelphia. Well, that's that word, and it is brotherly love. That is the word, and that's what it means, brotherly love. It it refers to the love that exists between brothers and sisters within a family. And when we apply it to the church... He's saying that we are to care for one another just like we would care for that brother or that sister in our own physical family. That's the type of concern we are to have for each other. You realize that the term brothers or brother is used by Paul some 230 times in the New Testament, starting with the book of Acts and going on down to the other end? 230 times to describe the the church or members of the church. We are to be brothers. And when we use those words, when we think about them, what does it mean? Do you realize that the word from which we get brother, which is adophos, is a word that means from the same womb? That's what it means, from the same womb. 
You and I here today are almost, maybe we should say we are. We are, I'm going to use this term, we are blood brothers and blood sisters. No, we didn't go through that little ritual when we were kids where you may take a little pocket knife or something and cut yourself and, you know, get the blood and touch it and say, oh, we're blood brothers now. No, not that way, but we are in another way. We are blood brothers and blood sisters. Why? Because we have been bought by the blood of Christ. And so we are connected to one another. When you think about brotherly love, what does it look like? What should it look like? Brotherly love is that which binds us together as a family. Brotherly love forms that unbreakable bond, that union. Yes, brothers may fight with each other when they're growing up, but later in life, if somebody else tries to go after one of them, the other one is going to be there to defend them to the hilt. You're my brother, and I may not like you at times, but you're mine. You belong to this family, and I'm going to stand up for you, and I'm going to, I'm going to step in for you. The big brother that steps into the fight to protect the little brother or maybe the sister or whoever it may be. And we have a deep affection for one another. That's what brotherly love is about. We have an affection in which we care for one another. And we are going to nourish each other. And we're going to nurture each other. As a parent, have you ever said to a, a, an older child, I want you to look out for your little brother. Or I want you to look out for your little sister. You're the big brother in the family. You have a responsibility, and I want you to make sure that you kind of watch out and make sure they don't get into something they shouldn't get into, or you help them if they do. Folks, that's what brotherly love is all about. And we are concerned for one another. We're going to look out for each other's welfare. Folks, that's what we do. It's the church. We nourish each other. We encourage each other. We look out for one another's welfare. We have a deep affection one for another. But the question I have for us this morning is, do, or does that exist among us? Because it should if it doesn't. Paul wants us to have that kind of relationship as a body of Christians. Where we truly care about each other and we want to know that somebody is doing well. Are you doing okay? Can I help? Let me, let me reach in and do what I can in this. But then the second part of that is he says, be devoted to one another. And I love the way the New American Standard, that's, that's its translation. Kindly affection is the King James translation of that. Kindly affection toward one another. But be devoted to one another. That is the extent of our brotherly love. What does it mean? When somebody says about a man, he is devoted to her. What does that mean to you? You know in your mind what that means. If somebody says about a man's attitude toward his wife, he is devoted to her. It means he cares about her. He's concerned about her well-being. He's going to make sure that she is cared for and that she is protected and nourished and loved because why? He is devoted. He is loyal. He is a one-woman man. He's devoted. She's devoted to her children. She's devoted to her husband. We understand that concept, don't we, in human terms. When we think about our families and we speak about somebody being devoted to another person, our devotion in brotherly love isn't just a matter, folks, of being polite to our fellow Christians because that's what we're supposed to do. It, it, and now this person is a member of the church, and because they're a member of the church, I'm supposed to be polite to them. I'm supposed to show them some kind of, some kind of concern. No, Paul takes it deeper than that. He wants us to be kindly affection toward one another. Our relationships are to be deeper because, as I said earlier, we are blood brothers. We have been redeemed through his blood as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. But the question for us this morning is a very simple question. How do we grow in our brotherly love and in our devotion to that love? 
it begins, first of all, with us focusing upon what the Bible says about brotherly love. Because Paul has several things to say about it, and Peter does too. And when we look at what Scripture says, we begin to see there is, there is a description of how it is to play out. Let me just share with you some of those. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there in verse 9, he says, Let the love of the brethren, he says, As to love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For indeed you practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. It is something that we're always to strive at growing in our love for one another. We will never reach a point where we have, oh, I'm, I'm, I've loved you as much as I can love you. This is, this is it. Men, do you ever stop loving the woman that you asked to be your wife? Or wives, do you ever stop loving that man that you asked to be your husband? Does that love not grow with time as you become more mature? And as you realize more of what is involved in loving somebody, even through the thick and the thin of life? You see, we grow, we excel, we work at doing that. It's not something that just comes natural, as we pointed out last week when it comes to being a part of the body of Christ. It's not something we can just set on autopilot and we just do that. We work at it. You know, there are times that we didn't like our brothers or our sisters growing up because they got into our business or maybe they, they took something of ours or whatever it may be. And we may have gotten angry with them for the moment, but then after that passed, we were close. And we wanted to be around them. Another passage that you have before you is one we find in Hebrews chapter 3, there in verse 1, where the writer says, Let love of the brethren continue. And notice what he says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for by this some have entertained angels unawares or without knowing it but he says here that part of that love is to show hospitality to reach out to one another and to do for one another he adds some more things he said remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated as though you yourselves also are, as since you yourselves also are in the body. You see, brotherly love says, I want to have you in my home. I want to know you. I want to reach out to you. If you're in trouble, I want to be there for you. If you're hurting, I want to suffer with you, and I want to rejoice with you when things are going well. Another passage, these, this is Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, there in verse 22 and then verse 23, he says, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, notice what he says, fervently love one another from the heart. As I said, it's not just a superficial, we love from within, we deeply care about one another. To sum it up, 1 Peter 3, verse 8, Here's what he says. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Think about that. Harmonious. We want to work together in harmony. We want to be on the same page. We want to be people who are sympathetic toward one another. We've got an opportunity to do that this week because one of our own has passed away and there's a family that needs our sympathy and needs us reaching out to them. That's the way brothers and sisters do for one another. He also added kind-hearted. A kind-hearted person is always willing to do what they can for another and also humble in spirit. Brothers putting brothers ahead of themselves Sisters doing the same for other sisters, and vice versa. But another way that we grow in that brotherly love is by evaluating our attitudes and our actions that we have toward each other. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, he said, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. If you look down five verses beyond that, in verse 15, and I've already touched on this one, Paul goes on to say, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We need to be a people who aren't afraid to rejoice with others and even to weep 
But both of those are emotions. And what he's saying is that those deep feelings of joy and sadness should be a part of the body of Christ. It's okay to rejoice with somebody and say, boy to someone if they've, if they've had great success in their life and to praise them and to encourage them to even greater things. It's okay to go and sit down and weep with somebody because of tears they're shedding at the loss of a loved one or something tragic has happened in their lives. And yet some Christians find it difficult to identify with other Christians that are going through those things, do we not? And I think sometimes there are reasons from our own past that keep us from being able to do that. Maybe you've been a person who was deeply hurt by somebody else somewhere in the past in your life, and because of that, you have a very difficult time showing your emotions. You hold it in. You don't want to express your feelings to somebody else because somebody hurt you however long ago it may have been. Maybe you were a person here this morning that grew up in a home where physical affection just was not shown. You may never have seen your mother hug your dad or your mom kiss your dad or, or you may have never seen them, they may have never hugged you. The other day, it was kind of funny in our home, Sky was there and I said something to her. I said, Sky, I'm fixing to hug Nana. And she just grinned, and I gave my wife a hug. And then I said, Sky, I'm going to kiss Donna. And she covered her eyes. <laughs> but you see, to see those things. Now, I'm not saying you go around kissing one another. But I am saying that we are to be a people who show our affections. And if we couldn't see that when we were growing up, if sometimes that was difficult, it may be hard for us to truly reach out and to give someone a hug. To tell someone, I care about you, I love you, I'm praying for you, and yet that's what we need to be doing. And we are sometimes controlled by deep feelings of anger or resentment that we have towards somebody else, and that is still carrying over in our lives today. Maybe we are people who are selfish. We're self-centered. We want it to be about us. We want the conversation to be about us. We want people to be thinking about us instead of us thinking about others. Folks, if these things are keeping you from being the person that God wants you to be, showing that brotherly love, being devoted to one another in that way, then ask God, help me to overcome these things from my past, which prevent me from being that person you want me to be for you, so that I can be a caring individual in this family of God that meets here and worships. I want to be that. In 1975, a man by the name of Lanny Wolf wrote a hymn that speaks of the relationship we have as a family of God. That's another one of those songs that for the first time I heard it at another workshop. It was the White Bluff Soul Winning Workshop in the 70s. And I remember these words. They've stayed with me and we still sing them today. We're part of a family that's been born again. Part of a family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of a family that's on its way home. The second line says, when brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he's passed through the valley, we all feel relief. Together in sunshine, together in rain, together in victory through his precious name. And though some go before us, we'll all meet again, just inside the city as we enter in. There will be no more parting. With Jesus we'll be together forever. God's family. And the chorus, you've heard it. Sometimes we laugh together. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get together. God's family. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you a part of God's family? Are you a part of that family that's on its way home? That family who's been bought with the blood of Christ, who've had their sins redeemed or washed away and their, their, their souls redeemed back to God. Are you a part of that family that laughs together, cries together, shares its dreams together, and longs for the day when we will all be together in that great home on high. If you're not this morning, please don't walk out this door without having the opportunity to confess the name of Christ. 
to be adopted into his family by being buried with him in the waters of baptism. Don't leave this building this morning without acknowledging your sin and repenting of it and seeking an obedience to become God's child. If you need to become a part of God's family this morning, won't you do so as together we stand and sing.